model student today. Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, who is uh, Chen Yun Dai. He's a senior PhD student at the CS department. He, he does a lot of research on data security. Thank so, you very much. Hello everyone. Um, today the title of my presentation is Privacy Preserving Assessments of Location Data Trustworthiness. So before we uh, start everything, start everything to discuss everything in details, uh, let's let me let me give you an example that may motivates our research work. So suppose you are a police department officer and you want to invest a, a crime and you know that the crime scene, um, so in this example, is at location Y. So we have two, three locations, location X, Y, and Z, and Y is the crime scene, uh, which we are interested in. And we have three suspects, namely Alice, Bob, and Carol. And we have observations that they were in um, location X at 1 p.m. at a certain day. And we also have a have some observations. Our witness says that Alice and Carol is at the crime scene at uh, location Y at 2 p.m. And another ob observation that Alice and Carol is at location Z at 3 p.m. However, for Bob, we don't really have its observation at uh, 2 p.m. So Bob reported that he's at location Y, uh, Y prime at 2 p.m. by himself. And we also observed that um, Bob is at location Z at 3 p.m. So our question is, um, we don't have any, you know, we, we cannot verify that Bob, Bob's location at 2 p.m. And our question is, is it true that Bob is at Y prime um, at 2 p.m. as he reported? So if we can get some other information, for example, in this example, we get a piece of anonymous data from a traffic management system, which is in red trajectory in this example. So suppose we don't have any other, you know, moving objects, moving individuals uh, in this area. We can have some conclusion that one of them, although so um, data has been anonymized, so we cannot really see uh, the identity of each each trajectory in this example. We can still say that we can still conclude that one of the trajectory may be Bob's, and Bob is possibly in the in the crime scene at that time. And the location Y prime reported by uh, Bob uh, himself may be may be wrong. So, any questions so far? So, our question is: How can we make use of anonymized data? We use two approaches. Uh, one is called common pattern analysis. Um, this, the reason that we want to use common pattern analysis is that um, typically the anonymized data is available in very large volumes. So although during the you know, anonymization process, um, some data may be modified to fulfill the requirements of privacy, um, the movement patterns can still be uh, properly estimated because those data is, in, uh, is available in large volumes. And another approach is called uh, confluence support analysis. Um, so in this analysis, what we tend to do is to link the local one of the uh, trajectory in the local data sets of exact information with the uh, remote data set of anonymized information. So. Uh, in other in other words, we want to, you know, kind of make a one-to-one -one mapping between the local data set to the remote data set. And our goal is to refine the trustworthiness, um, to refine the trustworthiness assessment using anonymized data. So this figure shows the system architecture um, of our framework. So basically, uh, the law informants agency possess a local data set and it is able to compute uh, trustworthiness of its local data set. When he wants to you know, verify its local data set, 
it sends queries to some remote parties. In this example, it's um, a GSM server which records uh, the cell phone user's location. And uh, another remote party is the traffic management system. Um, so after receiving the queries from the law informants agency, it returns uh, anonymized data uh, to, the, to the law informants agency. And then the law informants agency um, try to use the remote data to compute the trustworthiness of its local data. So one thing to uh, keep in mind is that since the, uh, the remote party only returns anonymized data, so the privacy of the individual who used the, who used the cell phone services or, the, or used the traffic management system can be preserved. So one key component of our work is the privacy model. Uh, we didn't develop our own privacy model. We, on the other hand, we use an existing um, privacy model proposed in a paper in 2000, uh, ICD 2008. Um, the name of the paper is Never Walk Alone. So let's take a, uh, just l let me introduce briefly how the model works. So, uh, so does everyone know what is key anonymity? Who knows key anonymity? Okay. Okay. Let me let me just give you a a brief introduction. What is key anonymity? Basically, it means that um, if we form a, a group of key members, uh, the one of the member, uh, uh, one of the member in this group cannot be distinguished from the other k minus one members. So that's the basic concept of key anonymity. So um, so for example. Uh, in this example, we want to form a two anonymity group. So what should we do? So first thing is that we have uh, we choose a trajectory t one, and we find the closest trajectory to t one, which is t two in this example. Then we compute the mean trajectory um, for these two trajectories, and produce a bounding tube of diameter delta. So data here is a user-defined privacy parameter. Or in some publications, it's a, a parameter which, um, uh, which determines uh, uncertainty. So what does this parameter mean is that if two trajectory is within a, a bounding tube of diameter data, it is considered that uh, those two trajectory cannot be distinguished with each other. So um, so in this example, the next step we need to do is to, to do a space translation. We move anything uh, outside of the bounding tube inside the bounding tube. So if you see this uh, move, uh, space translation, basically uh, we move uh, actually four points here to form this um, um, two, anonymity, two anonymity set. So here we can see that a two data set is created. So any questions so far? Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so next step, we want I want to introduce you the common pattern analysis procedure. So we have a few definitions to introduce. Um, if we have five individuals at time uh, one p.m. Uh, at time 2 p.m., they move to another location. Then at 3 p.m., they are at um, other locations. So we say those, uh, those traces, uh, those traces formed by the tra uh, individual's trajectories. We call them trajectories. And for the location associated with each timestamps, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., we call them positions. And we classed those data so that um, locations, so that positions which are close to each other will be formed clusters. And if the successor of a movement and the, uh, if, if a predecessor of a movement and successor of a movement are within the same cluster, we will call it group of movements. So in this example, we will have four group of movements. And within each group of movements, if 
the start time and the end time is close to each other. We said that we call them patterns. Basically, they are, they are, if, we, if the pattern is common, then we call it common patterns. So in this example, although we have three movements in a group of movements, since, uh, since they have different start time and end time, we only have two patterns. So let me give you an example how we use the common pattern analysis to compute the trust scores. So um, for example, we have uh, that many positions in the local data set. The first step is to class those positions. After that, we, uh, after we get the remote, uh, remote tubes um, from the remote data set, uh, we continue our pro uh, clustering procedure by injecting those um, remote tubes to the existing clusters. <coughs> and we discard uh, the remote tubes which, is, uh, which are too far away from the local clusters. So you will see that uh, we have um, six remote cluster uh, tubes, but after we discard two, we only have four. After that, we will consider group of movements. So um, if we want to compute the pattern uh, in purple in this example, basically three purple movements from uh, cluster C1 to uh, C2 and start from 2 p.m. Uh, and at 4 p.m. Um, first thing is that we uh, we compute K, which is the group of movements from which PT is chosen. Uh, in this example, we have actually the size of the group of movements, group of movement is um, five. And we also compute K prime. K prime is the movements um, which, is, which uh, contains in K and contains only local movements from C1 to C2. So in this example, uh, it is uh, actually three, I think. We also need to consider other group of movements starting at C1 and C2 and uh, uh, starting at um, C1. So we see that there are three um, group, group of movements starting, starting at C1, which is G1, G2, and G3. And we computed the G, uh, GI prime, which contains only local movements. And also, we need to consider group of movements, group of movements ending at C2. Uh, in this example, it's H1 and H2. Again, we only consider the uh, HI prime, which contains only the local movements. So in the end, we use this equation to compute the trustworthiness of this pattern. So. The intuition behind this equation is that uh, basically we want to compute the common pattern, right? So to compute the common pattern, we need to consider whether, um, uh, so basically this pattern starts from C1 and ends at C2. We need to consider all the movements, all the patterns start from C1 and all the patterns uh, end at C2. So if the movement from C1 to C2 is the majority, we definitely need to assign a high score to this pattern. If it is not, we will assign a low score. Um, but that's the reason we want to consider um, the group of movements uh, like G1, G2, and G3, and H1, H2. The reason we want to, we only, uh, we only consider the local movements when we do this computation is that, um, so if there's a remote data set supports the current pattern that we want to compute, in this example, it's PT, um, we want to increase its score. We don't want to reduce the score of, uh, because we already see and support. We don't want to reduce its score. That's the reason we, uh, when we uh, do the division, we only consider the local movements. So the next, um, so any questions for the common pattern analysis? So the second approach uh, I want to introduce is the confidence support analysis.
uh, still some definitions. So when we say two positions um, support each other, we need to consider a threshold. Um, so if uh, we have two positions, PA and PB, uh, which belongs to two different um, trajectory and has shares the same uh, identity ID. You can see that OID is the same. And if TA equals to TB, which means they share the same time uh, stamp, and the distance, uh, the distance between PA and PB is less than five, then um, PA and PB, we say PA and PB support each other. Otherwise, if they uh, exceed their distance, exceed the threshold, we say PA and PB uh, conflict with each other. So another definition I want to introduce is the distance between two, tra two trajectories. Um, if um, two trajectory T and T prime um, defined in the same time span, which means that for each position, uh, in these two trajectories, they have the same timestamp. They have the same pair of timestamp. Um, we use the average distance between each pair of positions uh, of T and T prime um, as they are as the distance between these two trajectories. So this example actually uh, shows uh, what is conflict and support. So if we have complement support threshold phi, and we have d1, d2, d3, and d4 for distance. So d1 is less than phi, so p1 support p, p1 prime. And same for uh, p3, p3 prime, p4, p4 prime. However, um, d2 is greater than phi, so P2 conflicts P2 prime. And the average distance between these two trajectory is the average distance uh, uh, is the distance of D1 add to D4 and divide by 4. So the next step um, the next step is to do a mapping between the local trajectories to the to the remote trajectories. Uh, I will show you what is the difficulty uh, in this problem. So suppose we have four local trajectories, L1 to L4, and we have three um, remote trajectories, R1 to R3. Then, so if we, spe uh, we start from a specific, a specific trajectory, in this example, L1, and try to assign the closest trajectory to um, L1. Let's see what will happen. So since R1 is the closest remote trajectory to L1, so it will be mapped to L1. Since R1 is already taken, L2 can only map to um, R2. And since R2 is taken, L3 will cho choose the uh, closest available uh, available closest trajectory which is remote trajectory which is R3 and L4 will map map to nobody so this is the map that we get if we will start from L1 and try to find the closest trajectory uh, for each one so but you can see that you can see that obviously it's not a really good mapping right because L1 is really far from R1 so another, a good mapping will be something like this. Um, L2 mapped to R1, and L3 mapped to R2, and L4 mapped to R3. So it's a, it's a much better configuration in this example. And we leave L1 mapped to nobody. So if, if we use a greedy method, we can get this configuration, which means that every time we take the closest map, uh, we take the closest uh, two trajectory which is closest to each other at each time. However, even we use a greedy method, it may not work every time. For example, in this example, 
uh, the closest will be R1 to map to L2. So if we take this as a, as a, we assign R1 to L2 first, the next step we can only assign L2, L1 to R2. Then again, this is a very bad mapping because we can easily find a better mapping, something like this. We map L1 to R1 and L2 to R2. Although uh, the closest remote trajectory to L2 is R1, but you know, on average, it's a, uh, the second configuration is a better mapping. So um, to do that, we introduce um, basically a cost. Um, the cost is um, if uh, between uh, two trajectory, if the average distance between uh, uh, L1 and R1 is less than five, then it, it will be the average distance between these two trajectory. If it exceed, um, and if we exceed five, and there will be a certain default value we set to max. So, um, formally, this is the uh, cost function we use uh, in our research work. So basically, if two trajectory, the average distance between two trajectory is less than five, then it will be the average distance itself. If it's greater than five, then it will be a W, which is a default value for max distance. And if you can see from previous example, the number of local trajectory may not be the same as the number of remote trajectories. So if we need to introduce some um, uh, dummy trajectories in the remote data set, basically T is mapped to the local uh, trajectory T is mapped to a dummy trajectory, then the cost will be W again, basically because we don't have a map for, for T. But if the number of uh, remote trajectory is greater than the number of local trajectories, then some, some of the remote trajectory may not get a map. So at that, at that point, um, if T is dummy, um, then the cost will be set to zero. And um, then we can um, basically convert this problem to the following uh, problem. Basically, we want to minimize the cost uh, to provide a configuration which is defined a one-to-one -one mapping correspondence between local and remote trajectories. Uh, we can have a cost and our goal is to minimize this cost. And again, um, we can convert Again, this problem to basically, once we have the cost function, we can build a matrix. And then our uh, problem will become something like this. And so um, x, i, j will be um, the, the basically um, uh, if uh, it introduce uh, I uh, corresponding to the the uh, trajectory belongs to the local uh, local data set and J belongs to the remote data set and we have the constraint that x j i equals to one. What does it mean? It means that every local trajectory can only map to one remote trajectory, and x uh, the sum of x i j equals to one if i belongs to local trajectory. That means that um, a remote trajectory can only map to one um, local trajectory. And x, uh, x is either zero or one, means it e either maps to a trajectory or it doesn't map to a trajectory. So cost ij is the element in the i's row and j's column of the cost matrix. Um, for this problem, there already exists an uh, order n, script, uh, n to the three algorithm, which is called the Hungarian method that can solve this problem. Uh, the Hungarian method actually already exists, I think, for 100 years. So I'm not going to uh, go into details for this Hungarian method. 
So let's take a look at the, this example, uh, which will show you how it works. Um, so in this example, R4 is the um, R4 is introduced dummy nodes in the remote data set because we we have four local trajectories and we only have three remote trajectories. So you can if you can see the, from this matrix, uh, all the uh, all the cost uh, all the cost from L1 to R4 is all ten because ten is the default maximum value, and L1 to R2 and R3 are also 10. Why is it? Because the phi is set to 0 0.6. So the distance between L1 to R2 and R3 exceed this uh, threshold. So they also set to 10 as the maximum default. And we want to compute um, the, the total cost and this cost function uh, has this constraint. After compute, after running this uh, Hungarian method, we will get um, this set of mapping which satisfy this constraint and with the minimum, minimum cost. So here the minimum cost will be 10.3. Uh, the result will be um, L2 mapped to R1 and uh, L3 mapped to R2 and L4 mapped to R3 and L1 will map to a dummy node. In other words, it will map to nobody. So we have a mapping here. Uh, basically, we build a link between the local trajectories and remote trajectories. Then how we compute the trust scores for the confidence support analysis. So we assume that initially we assume that all the trust scores, no matter it is a remote trajectory or a local trajectory, it's all 0 0.5 because we don't have any opinions on that. So then we use these two equations to adjust those scores. So in the first, uh, if P is supported by P prime, so basically P and P prime, uh, you know, uh, P is from a local trajectory and P prime is the mapped trajectory uh, from a remote data set. So if they support each other, then um, we use the following equation. Basically, uh, you, what you need to pay attention is this part. So if the distance uh, between P and P prime equals to five, which is the threshold, then this will become one and one minus one is zero, and this part will be, become zero. Since uh, then SCAS, the, basically it means that nothing will be updated, uh, and it will become the initial, because uh, on the borderline, we, we, don't want to, uh, we don't want to change the score, because if it equals to five, we don't know whether it is support, whether they support each other or conflict each other. However, if dp and p prime is less than five, then we can say that they really support each other. Then this part will greater than one, and this will less than s initial p prime, and in the, uh, the result will be, uh, the result will increase this initial s initial p. So in the second quest, uh, in the second equation, if p is conflicts p prime. Let's again look at this, this part. So if distance uh, between P and P prime equals to five, then this one will become zero, and the whole thing will become one, and uh, SCSP will equals to S initial P, which means it doesn't change, because again, if it's on the borderline, then we won't, don't want to update its score. However, uh, if it really conflicts P and P P prime really conflict with each other. Then this one, this part, uh, will 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 be greater than. Um, this part will be greater than one. Uh, 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 sorry, this part will be a positive number, and uh, then we will have a positive number from this part, and 
this one, this number will be less than one. So S initial P will times a number which is less than one. So in the end, we decrease the score of S initial P. So which makes sense because if we find someone uh, support position P, we increase its score and uh, it conflict. If it's conflict with P, then it decreases the score. So next, let's look at the experimental evaluation part. So in the experiment, we use a data set which contains um, um, 17,320 uh, 17, points and totally 2,675 trajectories. Uh, actually, it's a track data set uh, recorded in Athens. Um, the total, uh, if we use uh, if we use a circle to bound all the positions for these points, uh, the diameter of this circle is approximately fifty kilometer. And here's the parameters that we use in the example. So the diameter of um, anonymized tube uh, is from two hundred to two thousand meters, and k is from five to fifty. Completeness ratio is 20% to 100%, and distortion percentage is uh, 5% to 30%. Uh, the distortion percentage here means that how many, how many magnitudes we introduce, uh, how many magnitudes of the fake value we introduce in the data set. Uh, because we don't really have a fake fake, real fake data set. So what we do is that we uh, modify the real data set by introducing some um, uh, random fake values. We use this distortion percentage to control how many, how large the fake values we introduce in the data set. Complete ratio means that what is the number of um, points, uh, what, are, what is the number of trajectories uh, contained in the local, uh, in the remote data set. And we evaluate uh, based on the following criteria. Basically, how much score increase for the correct data and score decrease for the incorrect data. So this is the running time for common pattern analysis. Um, we can see that uh, even the completeness ratio is 100, which means we deal with about 17,000 data points. The running time is about like 12 seconds. It's very fast. And the execution of uh, execution time for the conflict support is e it's even better. The reason is that uh, for the uh, for the conflict support analysis, uh, we need to first uh, divide remote data by equivalent classes. So the data set is kind of small. Uh, so we only need uh, several hundreds of milliseconds to complete uh, to complete the algorithms. So let's look at how the um, k values um, impact the results. So we can see that uh, uh, when the k values uh, increase, the gap between the average scores of um, before uh, the gap between the average score before we introduce the remote data and after we introduce the remote data is is, is be become smaller. The reason is that large k value actually introduce more translation errors. So the remote data set becomes more and more imprecise and it's more and more unuseful. Uh, that's the reason uh, you can see that the the gap is becomes smaller. So if if it's if the k is too large, basically the remote data set will be really not useful. We will discard it in the end. So we actually end up with not you uh, not increase much. The uh, the the trust score will not increase much. So um, the second graph shows the complete. Uh, if we increase the completeness ratio. Uh, what is the gap uh, between the average score of uh, if we if we include the remote data and the, uh, before we include the remote data and after we include the remote data? You can see uh, 
the gap between those two average score is constantly almost the, almost the same. And the 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 both of the average scores decrease. The reason is that when we uh, include uh, more and more data, so because the nature of the uh, nature of the equation we use, we have to have this effect. And if we increase the data, what will happen? Actually, um, the gap uh, increase a, uh, slightly. The reason is that uh, when the data is large, actually we introduce less trans translation error. So uh, although the although the user um, basically we introduce uh, less translation error, so the gap actually uh, increase because the, the the data we receive from the remote data set is more useful. Um, so, the previous uh, experiments is performed on um, common pattern analysis. So let's take a look at what the conflict support analysis. <clears throat> in, the in this example, we increase the number of suspects, and we can see that increased number of suspect doesn't make much impact on the average trust tr tr score of incorrect data and. Uh, correct data. We can see that the trust score, average trust score of um, correct data is close to uh, 0 0.75 and incorrect data is close to uh, 0 0.25. The reason is that we only consider one local data set and one remote data set. So the maximum trust score for the correct data is 0 0.75 at the minimum of the trust score is 0 0.25. And we can see that our algorithm can uh, easily distinguish from, from uh, easily di distinguish incorrect data from uh, correct data. So, uh, but still there are some small difference between, uh, uh, between the, uh, basically if you see that um, when phi equals to 5%, um, the trust score is lower than the uh, phi equals to uh, twenty percent. Um, the reason is that when you um, so basically when you uh, introduce uh, less error, so phi controls the magnitude of fake values we uh, we inject in the in the in the data set. So if we introduce a small amount of um, fake values. Actually, it's it's difficult for the algorithm to distinguish uh, the correct value from the incorrect value. So, this figure shows if we change the distortion percentage, what is the effect? What is the effect of the performance? So, it's actually it's a very interesting figure. Um, so, at the if we see, uh, so basically, distortion percentage means that. We, um, which mean, means that how many, uh, what is the magnitude of fake value we inject in the data set. And for each line, uh, for, for example, 5%, it means that we use phi equals to 5% to distinguish the correct values and the incorrect values. We see that at the very beginning, it's difficult to in distinguish. The reason is that we use 5%, we use 5% distortion percentage. And if uh, if uh, we use five as the five percent as the threshold, uh, we can distinguish some of them. So uh, so if you see the rectangle line, it's zero point five. The average trust score for the incorrect data is zero point five. However, if it's uh, we use threshold ten percent or twenty percent, because the magnitude of fake fake value is small we really cannot uh, distinguish um, fake values from the real values so uh, so everything is close to uh, 0 0.7 um, however if we increase the uh, distortion percentage which means that we increase 
more uh, uh, more magnitude of fake values. Uh, when it reaches twenty percent, uh, at that time, um, the five percent line and the ten percent line already close to zero point two five. However, the twenty percent is still uh, is it drops to zero point five. And if we keep increasing the magnitude, uh, in the end we can def uh, we can identify all the fake values. So, um, in this paper, we uh, propose anonymize. Uh, we can s uh, our we can see that um, our conclusion is that anonymized data can significantly improve uh, trustworthiness assessment accuracy, and we propose two techniques. One is called common pattern analysis. Another one is called confidence support analysis, um, and for the future work of this research work, um, I want to actually adopt more uh, privacy models like differential privacy. The reason is that um, k-anonymity mod privacy model is considered to be weak uh, with respect to privacy requirements. Um, and uh, differential privacy model is a more strong model. So uh, we really want to adopt that model. And we want to take the factor in the road network characteristics because that in the current research work, uh, we only consider trajectories. We only use those trajectory to compute the common pattern. However, we know that um, if there's, there doesn't exist a road, we cannot move from um, uh, some of the paths may not, <laughs> some of the trajectory is, is not realistic. So we, if we use road network as an additional piece of uh, supporting information, it will be interesting to, to see how the, uh, how the, compute, uh, how the trust was, was in this model changes. Um, any questions? So we have some time for questions. So do you have any questions? Okay, so perhaps, uh, since we have still uh, five minutes, can you discuss whether this type of uh, trustworthiness assessment can be applied uh, to other types of data other than uh, location data? Okay. For example, um, social network. Yes, yes. So uh, definitely the, those type of um, uh, techniques can be used to um, apply on some other data, uh, other kind of data, for example, social network data. So suppose you have, uh, let me give you an example. So suppose we have a local insurance company. So if so, I know that some of the local uh, insurance company will give you, so for example, you are already a customer. It may provide you some incentive um, uh, like discounts. For example, if you bring some new customers to the company, it will give you some discount for its um, insurance uh, policies, for example. Um, so through these incentive techniques, it can form a local social network. For example, uh, Bob introduced three of his friends uh, to this company, and um, the company can know, okay, uh, because they are recommended by Bob, they must know, they must know each other. And uh, after a period of time, after this uh, procedure continues, it can form a local social network. Uh, and um, so when the reason that those companies may want to, uh, you know, have this local social network is because, so sometimes um, the policies, the, the money that you need to pay for the insurance policies may change depending on your like location, age. For example, if you are like older than 25 and your location is in Indiana, then the, probably you just need to pay $100 for like six months for your car insurance. But if you are less than 25 and uh, maybe you are in California, maybe the an amount of money you need to pay is like two or three times, uh, uh, maybe two or three hundred dollars. So. So because of this reason, so the, 
the customer who you know enrolled in a new uh, insurance policy may fake their um, like fake their some some of their um, profile information. For example, age, location, maybe marriage status, so or maybe education level. So some of them may be easy to detect. Other other may not be very easy to detect. For example, uh, I can move to California to stay for a few months and get some like bank statement, and use that information to uh, to get a cheaper uh, insurance policy. Then so the the motivation for the for the insurance company is to use uh, to to verify the local information, but. The only thing he has is a social, a local social network graph. So, um, but those, but we already have large social network. Uh, for example, Facebook uh, and uh, LinkedIn. So, large social network. So, those so those social network may contains uh, real values of someone's attributes. For example, LinkedIn. You don't want to, you know, fake your education level in LinkedIn, right? So those, uh, uh, so those social network can be used to verify uh, the local social network. However, uh, again, the challenge is that for those big social network like Facebook, he cannot, you know, just publish his data because that will definitely, um, that will definitely um, violate the privacy laws. So the only thing he can do is that to publish the anonymized uh, social network uh, that uh, preserve the privacy. Uh, so the challenge will be how to make use of the anonymized social network to verify our local social network. There are other questions? If not, thanks.